glad to be here. I love Canada because in 1976, even though polls showed that 70% of Canadians thought they wanted the death penalty, your parliament had the leadership and good sense not to bring it into Canada. And so you have been down a life road and we in the United States have been down a dark death road. We have killed over a thousand people by uh, shooting, electrocution, gas, lethal injection. We're still killing. Uh, I wanna commend our wonderful actors tonight. Great job on, on that scene. Uh, it's really good. Um, we need the three ways that I see that we're helped to get underneath the realities of what goes on in our culture is education, spirituality, belonging to a faith community. And the third way is art. We need art because art pulls the curtains back. And when Tim Robbins was making the film, A Dead Man Walking, he said, you know, Helen, there's a difference between art and propaganda. Art, you really bring people into the issue, over to both sides, and you let the audience struggle with it. You don't tell them what to think. Propaganda means I'm against the death penalty, which in fact Tim Robbins is. So he said, I'm gonna construct the story in a way so you have the crime early on, then it's real fuzzy in the minds of the people. And then as you move on in the story, the person who did the crime, it's moving toward his execution. The sympathy goes with him, with his mother, with his little brothers, and you forget about the victims. And Tim Robbins said the boldest act that he did, and when they were editing the film A Dead Man Walking, Matthew Poncelet, who's the character in the film, had finally, there was that confession scene that we just saw here tonight, admitted that he had killed the boy and was truly contrite and was on his knees and was crying and then moved to his execution and said, ask forgiveness of the victim's family. And so the people working with Tim were saying, Tim, you got the audience, so let it be. Don't bring back the murder scene and bring him into that again. And Tim said, I don't wanna have the audience. And he said, that's what art is. And so you honestly, if you see the film, A Dead Man Walking, it, there's Matthew Poncelet on the gurney. And then juxtaposed with his death, we see the murder and all of its horribleness of two innocent young people in the woods. And there's an aerial view of their bodies splayed out. And there's Matthew Poncelet. And that's the way the film ends. I also had a wonderful editor at Random House when I wrote Dead Man Walking. I had never written a book before. And when Jason Epstein, I've only worked with great Jewish people at Random House in my books. These two books <laughs> is Catholic nun and good Jewish editors working on, working on books. And, um, and so when Jason Epstein looked at the first draft of the book of Dead Man Walking, he said, Helen, you wait far, far too long to talk about the crime. And I know you're all in the human rights of the person who did it and they shouldn't be executed and all. But if your reader in the first 10 pages of this book doesn't see you facing the crime and being horrified out at the crime yourself, they're not gonna read your book. Because they're gonna think, well, she's a Catholic nun. She believes in Jesus. Jesus said you're supposed to forgive people. They can expect every religious platitude from you. You got to face squarely the crime and the horror you feel at the killing of two innocent teenage kids. And then your job as an author is to take the reader with you on every page of this book and bring them gradually into, after standing with them in horror at the crime, gradually into what it means now for the state of Louisiana to take that man who did that crime and usher him from his cell and take him and kill him. And one of the things that became so clear to me 
was when I came out of the execution chamber after Pat Sonier was killed. He's the first story in this book. It was the middle of the night. They bring you in a prison vehicle to the gates of the prison. And I had never watched a human being be killed in front of my eyes before. It was all legal. Supreme Court had said it was okay. Uh, I think support in Louisiana in the 80s when this happened was something like 85% people supported the death penalty. Said we need to be tough on crime. Politicians running for office. The tougher on crime you could be, the quicker you got elected in the, in the deep south states. And, and I vomited. I, and, and I remember thinking it was very, very clear in my mind. And I guess you could say my mission was born that night of what brings me here to you and across every one of the 50 states and I don't know how many countries, was I thought to myself, the people are never going to get close to this. They're going to hear about it afterwards. But it's a secret ritual. There are only like 12 people that witness executions in the United States. They're the witnesses for the state. In Texas, who has killed over 500 human beings in their killing chamber. There's to, the gurney is like in a well in the middle where the person's strapped down to be killed. And over to the right of the person are the witnesses for the state. In the one-way glass, they can see out on the gurney, but we can't see them. And above where the, uh, above the head of the person being executed on the other side is where victims' families send representatives of the family to watch the execution. That's their justice that they're being given, and often the promise of closure, of healing by waiting and, and then being having an opportunity to witness the death. And on the, in the other witnessing chamber, looking down where the face of the person is on the gurney is where mothers have stood with their hands against that glass to watch as the state of Texas kill their child. And that is what we have been doing with the death penalty. The promise being, first of all, we're really going to be tough on crime. And when we started down this road in 1976, when our Supreme Court put the death penalty back, kind of the assumption, maybe the hope was, well, how much tougher on crime can you get than to say, if you kill somebody, you're going to be killed? So deterrence at the beginning was really an assumption a lot of us made. Two-thirds of the American people believed it, it was bound to be a deterrent. It's taken a long time, 30 years now. Twice police chiefs have been um, queried on it, given a list of 10 um, Ten remedies to violence, and they all put the death penalty dead last. And the way the police chiefs put it was, the people doing the thinking and the people doing the murdering are two different sets of people. Because if you're not thinking of consequences, and they said most of the people that do crimes don't even think they're going to get caught. So it has no consequences like where a person goes through the well, maybe I better not. I might get the death penalty. Oh, no, I don't want to die, so, oh, I'm not going to kill this person. There's no thinking process that goes on in most crimes. And so we're learning now that doesn't have any deterrent effect. And you look at the track record of the states that have done the death penalty the most, and you look at violence in that particular part of the country, it's more violence in the states that are doing the death penalty more. The cause is the violence, as you know, because in Canada, I give you credit in Canada. I do. I think you're a fresher nation. You've got a fresher start at doing it right. You have better benefits for your people. You have health care. You have better education. Um, and, and so you're going to put your resources into life on the front end and not into the exorbitant cost. This may seem counterintuitive to you, that it is extremely more important to have the death penalty than it is to have life without parole. And I say counterintuitive because you hear people saying the people that are really for the death penalty who just say, well, how expensive can it be to get a couple of chemicals we could just 
you know, put people out, but you know, you got to feed them the rest of their life, get a medical care the rest of their life. How expensive is that? And if you really want to blow your mind, take a look at California that has 744 people on death row. The biggest in the nation, far bigger than Texas. Texas executes people quicker, but California has 744 human beings in death row cells. The average weight in California for execution, if they ever execute people, is 25 years. And, and in California, they pay everybody. They pay the defense lawyers, they pay the prosecution, they pay the expert witnesses. They, for 13 executions, they spent $2 billion. There's $137 million to keep all of that machinery in place over one year's time, $300 million per execution. So the people are beginning to wise up in 2008 when we went into the recession, budget crunches on the states. Uh, they're looking at, well, you know, what are we doing putting all this money into killing one human being? We could be putting it into at-risk kids, health care for people, all the life things that our society calls us for. So I come to this. My awakening happened because I came to understand the deeper calling of the gospel of Jesus, the way Pope Francis is showing us what it means to follow the gospel, to go to the margins. I realized I came up in great privilege. Uh, my father was a successful lawyer. I went only to the best schools, so I was educated. Belonged to a community of sisters where I got support, I got challenge, deep spiritual grounding, so in many ways, I was surrounded with privilege, support, care. And so the waking up is in the first part of Dead Man Walking. And it had to do with hearing a talk. We never know when the Spirit of God is going to move us. When we become illumined or enlightened, when God wakes us up, it's always grace. We can put ourselves in the situation to be enlightened, but we can't wake ourselves up of the deepest realities, spiritual realities of life. And so that waking up, I heard a talk, and it led me to move into the St. Thomas housing projects in New Orleans. Now here I was, a white woman in the suburbs, doing good stuff, you know, teaching at St. Francis Cabrini, being the DRE in a Catholic <laughs> parish. But all of us had health care, all of us had education, there was not a high crime rate out in the suburbs of New Orleans, but in the inner city of New Orleans, where over 50% of the population is poor and African American, and I had never been to any of those places. I had never actually met and sat down or become friends with an African American person who was struggling against both poverty and racism. What did I know? And by moving to Hope House and with uh, four other sisters, we were the only white people in the, in the St. Thomas Housing Projects. And I began to learn about the other America. And I didn't go into St. Thomas so much to help all oh, those poor, struggling African-American poor people. I went there to be liberated myself. I sat at the feet of people and they became my teachers. Miss Ruby was coming to the Adult Learning Center when she was 75 years old because she wanted to learn to read the Bible before she died. And here come kids from the public schools, and I'd been reading the paper. I knew that the public schools in New Orleans were really, really bad. You'd read stories of teachers painting their own classrooms or bringing audiovisual supplies, and that it was, it was a terrible situation. But I was in the private Catholic school system out in the suburbs. I wasn't ever there. And I learned all the rules were different. I mean, the kid coming from a public school into our adult learning center, he just wanted to take his GED. I said, well, how far had you gotten in school? Well, he said, well, I was a junior. I go, well, junior, you're only one more year. You're going to graduate? So look, we're going to work with you on an individual level, your reading, your math. So get the reading book. He couldn't read a third grade reader. He was a junior in high school. 
even if he had graduated from the high school and gotten his diploma, he couldn't read. How could we have this two-class system? And I was always on the side of the people who had the, who had the privilege, who had the resources. And it was good. You can't blame parents. They want their kids to go to a good school. But I didn't know what poor people were really struggling with. And then when you get out in the suburbs and you hear people saying, why don't those people keep their kids in school? Why don't those people go get a job? Those people, those people, those people are lazy. They could get a job if they wanted to. This is the great American dream. And when we are separated from one another physically, and when we really don't meet each other and hear each other's stories and meet personally, that's the kind of stereotypes we do with each other. And Canada isn't any different. Those of us that have greater means because our fathers worked hard or whatever it is that we inherit in our family and as we come into it, we're always standing on the shoulders of other people who help us get where we are. And what that did to me, when that kid couldn't read that third grade reader and I thought of St. Joseph Academy and I thought of St. Mary's Dominican, I thought of the education I'd gotten it's not that I was so virtuous. It's just I was so blooming, cushioned, and resourced. And so one of the great things about being a middle-class person that has, we don't have to struggle to put food on the table or to pay the rent, is we can put all of our energies into working for justice to young people, to put our energies into helping to transform our society that has a lot of problems lot of struggles. And so I embark from St. Thomas. I get an invitation coming out of the Adult Learning Center one day. Hey, Sister Helen, you want to be a pen pal to somebody on death row? And I, I thought, yeah, sure, I can do that. You kind of understand how sneaky Jesus is. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever studied that in a theology course, but it could be called Sneaky Jesus Part 1, 2. So here's Sneaky Jesus part one. Hey, Sister Helen, you want to be a pen pal somebody on death row? I go, yeah, sure, I could do that. I could write letters. I was an English major, you know, maybe send a little poem or something like that, you know. <laughs> and I didn't know they were going to kill this person because we hadn't had an execution in Louisiana for over 20 years. In 1972, the Supreme Court in the United States had overturned the death penalty, saying that it was against minorities, that it was unconstitutional. It was arbitrarily and capriciously imposed. We're coming to that again to recognize hadn't changed at all. So there had been no executions. I really thought I was just going to be writing to somebody on death row. That person was going to be writing back to me. So then that sneaky Jesus part one, I write the letter. So the man writes back. So I write and he writes and I write and he writes. And that's an encounter. And Pope Francis is always talking about going out to the margins, but a gospel of encounter, not reading about other people, not hearing about other people, going to where they are. And the encounter is where the grace is. That's where God is. So anyway, and then I found out from his letters, he didn't have anybody who, who would come to visit him. His poor mama was mentally so stressed out what had happened. Here she had these sons that had done this terrible murder. She couldn't bring herself to walk into the building that said death row where they were gonna kill one of her sons. She couldn't do it, she'd break down. And he had written to her and said, Mama, don't come, it's okay, Mama. You pray for me and just send me letters. So I'm beginning to get from his letters that he doesn't have any visitors. He didn't even ask me to come. He never even asked me for money, for coffee or cigarettes. He was just glad somebody had found him and was praying for him and would write him the letters. So I'm meditating. How many times had I meditated on the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25? I was hungry, you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. And there were the words, I was in prison and you came to me. Every other time, I had come across those words in the scripture. See, because I think we all our own little spin doctors with the scriptures. Because, you know, I was in prison. I just thought, well, you know, there's a lot of ways of being in prison. Like if you're shy, you're in prison. 
It's the kind of prison if you're shy, you know. You go in a room with all these people and you just huddle in the corner. I don't know how to talk to all those people. That's a form of imprisonment. I never thought prison. And, but now here's a man, and I wrote him a letter. And here comes Sneaky Jesus Part 2. Because I just said, Pat, I'll come see you sometime. Boy, I return mail, the visitor forms. He's so happy. He'll get a visitor. And, and here it was. He just said, well, look, I'm a Catholic and you're a nun. Would you be my spiritual advisor? So I go, sure, fill it out. I got no felonies. Send it in. And I don't know that a little over two years after that, He's going to be executed at midnight in the electric chair at quarter to six in the evening. Everybody's going to have to leave the death house where he's being kept. The scene you saw where there's a special cell, holding cell till the time of his death. And everybody's going to have to leave that death house except the spiritual advisor who's going to be me and be able to, and we'll walk with him then to his death and read from Isaiah 43, I've called you by your name, you are mine. But you know what? The thing about grace is we have a maxim in our community that says never leap ahead of grace. See, the grace wasn't there then. And I'm sure if the way the invitation had come, you're going to write a letter to a death row inmate. You're going to write to him. Then you're going to visit him for two, a little over two years. Then you're going to accompany him to the electric chair. He's going to look at your face when they kill him. And you're going to come out of that, that uh, execution chamber and your life is going to be completely changed. I could never have said yes. But see, God's gentle with us. And the Holy Spirit inside our hearts is gentle with us. Can you write a letter? I write a letter, and it unfolds like the petals of a flower. It's very organic. It's integral. It's not this big dramatic jerks, and now I'm on death row. Now I'm with executed criminals. It was all gentle in its unfolding, and each step along the way I'm learning because I don't know anything about social justice. And that's the way I wrote the book. I wrote the book, it's in first person, and it's in present tense, so as I learn, you learn too. You come with me. And that way I can be, or become in the service of being a witness to you, the reader, taking you with me, so that through the pages of this book and through your own imagination and through the information you're gonna get about how the death penalty actually works, there's the theory of the death penalty. Oh, yeah, the death penalty is only reserved for the worst of the worst, and it's up to the discretion of the prosecutor to choose the worst of the worst. And then they, you have two trials, one just to find out if the person's guilty or not. And then if they found guilty, there are certain aggravating circumstances that you have to find, and then the jury has to vote unanimously to kill them. That's a theory of the death penalty. The practice of the death penalty is very, very different. In the Constitution of the United States, the lone individual brought up against the powers of the state is supposed to have certain constitutional protections. A quick and speedy trial to face your accusers, to be able to summon eyewitnesses in your own defense, to participate in your own defense, to have a lawyer by your side who is adequate and can conduct the defense, a fair and impartial jury of your peers. So then in Death of Innocence, you read about Dobie Gillis Williams, an African-American man with an IQ of 65, who in a little town of Manny, Louisiana, a white woman was stabbed to death in her bathroom. And the husband of the woman who was stabbed claimed that as he took his bleeding wife out and put her on the couch after she had been stabbed. She said to him, the husband was never, never checked out in terms of his own participation. Never checked. He was simply believed he's the white man. His wife was killed. And she said, a black man killed me. He crawled through the bathroom window. And that was what the prosecutor argued to that all-white jury 
that tried Dobie Gillis Williams in Louisiana. The most contorted, convulsive, unbelievable scenario of a crime you will ever hear. The prosecutor said to that all-white jury that Dobie Gillis Williams had climbed in through the bathroom window and they took a picture of that window and the window looks big. The, what they had done was they had blown up the window. In fact, the window was as big as a microwave oven and it was this high above the ground. And supposedly, because Dobie had no blood of the victim on him, Supposedly, he came in through that little window and then jumped out like an Olympic jumper, left no smudges on the windowsill. Blood was everywhere in the bathroom. And when he jumped into that window, and then he waited in the bathroom behind the door for that poor victim. What if the husband had come in the bathroom first? Well, he didn't get into that. And then he finds a steak knife on the back of the toilet where everybody keeps their steak knives. Isn't that where you keep your steak knives? And got that knife and stabbed that poor woman to death. And then she was seated on the toilet. And poor Mrs. Nippers, I mean, she had a terrible death. Then stood on her in the toilet and sprang out of the window without leaving the little curtains, little cheap curtains from uh, Kmart were still hanging without even being pulled off the hook, no smudges. And they believed, they believed that version. And they sentenced Dobie to death. One thing I learned, and I learned early on from the good lawyers, these Atticus Finches, you know, like in To Kill a Mockingbird, who get in there pro bono often and stand at the side of poor people that everybody hates and everybody wants to kill. And the lawyers that work with Pat Sonia, Millard Farmer, is the first hero lawyer I present in this book. And I have nothing but respect for these lawyers, the public defenders that take these cases. Whenever I sign a book to them, I say to one of our true heroes, because everybody hates these people and they all want to see them die. And you don't get kudos in the South for taking these cases. You don't get invited to certain cocktail parties, I can tell you that. And here Millard Farmer tried to save the life of Pat Sonier. And one of the key things I learned was if you don't have a lawyer by your side when you go to trial who raises formal objections, that's what happened to Dobie. His lawyer was so bad, all white jury being seated. White woman was the victim. And there were no formal objections to the seating of that jury. That when you come up to the appeals courts, they say there's no formal objection, so you and your lawyer must have discussed it and decided on a strategy that these are the people you wanted, and you can't raise it as a constitutional issue in an appeal. The other thing I learned was the importance of that lawyer. Just like you need a good doctor, if you have a serious illness, you need somebody who's a good, good diagnostician, can get to it, the same thing for a lawyer. So all the people that I was with, Pat, he saw his lawyer for one half hour before the trial. One half hour. And how do, you, how do you prepare a defense? How do you really represent your client? The other thing is that when you have a death penalty, and there are two trials, this is partly why it's so expensive, even on the front end, the sentencing part of the trial, the lawyer can present any mitigation that could just say to the jury, even to one juror, don't vote for death, to have mercy. So you can go into the childhood. You can, 90% of people on death row in the United States were abused as children. And when you go in and you start digging in and you find out what happened to them, all that violence pumped into them, and one day then they enact violence on innocent people, and then we want to kill them. So there's so much to learn. I was learning everywhere I looked. I'm learning from the lawyers. I'm learning in the reading. And then the experience itself. So in the story of Pat Sonier, and this is the second way my good Jewish editor helped me in this book, I didn't know what to do with the victim's family. I, I found out 
that Pat and his brother Eddie had killed in cold blood these two innocent teenage kids out near a sugar cane field where they'd gone for the, in this local lover's lane on a November night. And the brothers were rabbit hunting out in that field as they often did. They've been hunting from the time they were little. It was often the way their family got meat. And there they see the kids parked. They have flashlights and they came over. We found this out for five other teenage couples that this had happened to with Pat and Eddie Sonia, who were doing these things with teenage kids. But none of them had been killed, but some of the young women had been raped. It's just unspeakable. And they would pose, they get the kids to be parked in a real abandoned place long before cell phones. And here they'd see flashlights coming across the field and they come close to the car and there are these two men with 22 rifles. And they would say to the kids, well, you know, you're trespassing. We're the security people that work for the people that own this land. We're going to have to bring you to the owners. And then that quickly transpired into, well, look, tell you what, if the girl has sex with us, we won't take you to the owners. It was all a lie. They weren't security guards for anybody. And some of the young women had been raped. Nobody had been killed. But boy, this night, a November night, David LeBlanc, he was just 17. Uh, Loretta Bork was just 18. Their pictures were in the, the Daily Iberian, a little Cajun town in Louisiana. And their parents had sent their prom picture in to the newspaper, and there they were, young David and Loretta, smiling. It was on a happy night. They were beautiful. And there was the headline, Teenagers Found Murdered. When I, I've already begun then to visit with Pat and while I'm making the trip to the prison to visit with his brother Eddie. And now I find out the crime. And it was so horrific. They, they were shot in the back of the head. They were left lying in that sugar cane field. It was so unspeakable. It's every parent's worst nightmare for your child. And the last time the parents are going to see their children alive is the Blahs will remember they're standing there in the kitchen and David standing by the kitchen sink and his mama had gotten him a new blue long sleeve velour shirt and he's rubbing the arms of the shirt saying, Mama, this is going to keep me warm tonight. And his daddy said, yeah, but it couldn't keep him alive. And they, they'll remember the last words were about a shirt or the hem of a skirt or not knowing and in the opera of Dead Man Walking, which is very, very strong and good, it's, it's going all over the world. It premiered in San Francisco in the year 2000, and now it's all over the place. Uh, going to be at the Kennedy Center in February 2017 in Washington, D.C. But there's this song at the heart of the opera. And you have the victims' families there. You have the mother of Joseph de Rocher is the character in the opera. She's there, I'm in the middle, uh, in over my head, because I'm gonna make a very, very bad mistake with the victim's families. I'm not gonna do anything to reach out to them once I found out about the murders. I just said, well, they're not gonna wanna hear from me. I'm the spiritual advisor. With the two people who killed their kids, I'm the last person in the world they're gonna wanna see. And I met them at the worst possible time. Couldn't have been more polarized because it was a pardon board hearing one week before Pat was executed. And they are all packing in that room because the prosecutors told them, this is your last chance to get your justice. Don't you let some bleeding heart liberals try to talk that, those five appointees of the governor out of the execution of this person who deserves it. And you be there to make sure it happens. And that's when I met the victims' families. And the opera captures it. It's also in the film, because it was a bad mistake not to have reached out to them in any way. And so the, the heart of the opera is this medley of pain, because the victims' families are singing, you don't know what it's like to see your child go out the door. And the last word you ever say where do your homework, clean your room, fix your skirt. 
And the mother then, on the other side, is of Joseph de Roche is singing, you don't know what it's like to see your child slip through your fingers. Will my child ever know how much I love him? And they're singing, you don't know what it's like. And I'm in the middle just going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because I don't understand anything. And I did it all wrong before I did it right. And at one point, Mr. Hart, who's whose daughter was one of the people murdered, says to me, Sister, I think you say I'm sorry because you're in way over your head. Don't you believe that the person who stabbed my daughter deserves to die for what he did? And I'm saying, I'm just trying to do what Christ, and he said, don't give me Christ. Give me hell and praise on. Don't you believe that your same Lord and Savior that you believe in would want to see us get justice for our dead child. And may God have mercy on your soul because you are so out of line, way in over your head. It's fierce. And that actually happened, and I deserve their anger because I met them at the pardon board, and I hadn't written a note, I hadn't called them. And when does the nun appear? the pardon board hearing. And why am I there? To ask the pardon board not to execute the man who killed their children. And how could they not see me as the enemy? So we are in the, the pardon board. They're all speaking for why, and they have their relatives, and they have their friends, of why this execution needs to take place. And, and the victim's families are caught in this trauma, and they're caught in this loss, and they're and so you have the voices of the community all around them saying, you know, the death penalty, of course, look at your sorrow. He deserves the death penalty. Stand up for it. Stand up for your justice. And there I am asking the pardon board not to execute Pat Sonia. So while the pardon board was voting, they went behind closed doors and we were walking outside. And I ran right into both sets of parents. And the Borks, who had lost their daughter, they have always been angry at me. We were never able to reconcile. They saw me coming, and they just averted their heads like this, were quiet, and just walked by me in silence. And right behind them were the boys' parents. Lloyd and Eula LeBlanc, too old to have another child. David was their only son. They had a daughter, Vicky. And surprise by grace, because they walked right up to me. And Lloyd the boss said to me, Sister Helen, I'm the father of David. This is his mother. Sister, all this time, you've been visiting with those two brothers, and you didn't want to come to see us. Sister, you can't believe the pressure we're under with this death penalty. I don't know what he means. What did he mean, pressure? In every family, if you have somebody killed, then everybody in Louisiana is for the death penalty. Don't you want to see the death? What does he mean, pressure? And here's where he was the graceful one. I had done it all wrong. He was the one who extended his hand to me and said, Sister, I pray in this little chapel. Every Friday morning from 4 to 5, I keep vigil before the Blessed Sacrament. Come pray with me. And that was an invitation of grace I could not turn down. And so I found myself driving across this huge Atchafalaya swamp, leaving Baton Rouge at 2.30 in the morning to get there for four and to kneel alongside a man in this little chapel to pray the rosary together. It's a Friday, and on Friday we remember the sorrowful, suffering mysteries in the life of Christ and his mother. And I'm kneeling alongside a man who's praying through the agony and death of his only son. And it's as we were giving the intentions of the rosary was my first glimpse into Lloyd LeBlanc's soul. He's the hero of this book. And you will see why when you read it for yourself. But in the intentions I noticed that he had prayed, of course, for the safety of teenage kids. He prayed 
that David would be at peace with God, yeah. that Eula, his wife, that her heart could heal. They had had to change to move David's grave from a family plot in another little town to a cemetery near the house so that Eula, he said she can't make it through the day without visiting a boy's grave. And here he is then praying, and I notice he slips in a prayer for Mrs. Sonia, the mother of, of Pat and Eddie Sonia, the ones who had killed his son. He prays for her because he knew what Gladys Sonia was going through in the little town of St. Martinville, that when she would go to the store, she would overhear people saying, there she is loud enough for her to hear. That white trash woman, it's her sons that killed the book and the LeBlanc kids. What's she doing in here? And people were cutting up dead animals and throwing them on the front porch. And he prays for her. And he was the first victim's family I ever was with who took me through the journey, the crucible of a journey in his own heart. And as he grew to trust me more, he said, Sister, when I said to you, the pressure, you don't know the pressure we under with the death penalty? Here's what I mean by pressure. Everybody was saying to me, Lloyd, they killed your son. If you're not for the death penalty, it'll look like you didn't love your boy. And Sister, everybody was saying that to me. We couldn't hear anybody saying, you weren't there for me either. Sometimes you and I would go to Mass at different parish churches on Sunday to see if we could hear a priest get up and talk about the gospel of Jesus, that Jesus had called us to forgive our enemies, that Jesus had called us to pray for those who persecute us, not to give in to the hate, and we couldn't hear it anywhere. And as he took me then into his heart and he said, Sister, with all those people telling me that, Lloyd, you got to be for the death penalty? He said, they're right. And I went there. Inside my mind and my imagination, boy, I'd picture pivot both those brothers in the electric chair and I'm pulling the switch. I wanted them to feel pain. I almost lost my wife from her pain of losing her boy. Vicki, her life's been scarred forever trying to grow up with her murdered older brother. And so he said, I went there and I began to picture it and I began to, I could feel the hate and I wanted to feel it. And then he said, I noticed what was happening to me because I've always been a kind person. I learned it from my mom and daddy. And he said, I'm good with my hands, I can fix things. Sister, you're going to come to my house, you're going to see lawnmowers, or hey, Mr. Lloyd, can you fix this? I'll help anybody. That's who I am. And I was losing it, and I was angry all the time, and I'm snapping at Eula. And then he put his hand out like this, and he said, and I said, uh-uh. They killed our boy, but I'm not going to let him kill me. And he set his face to go down the road that Jesus had taught him. He was the first victim's family I met that taught me that what forgiveness is first and foremost is not so much to relieve the burden of the one who hurt you, though it may do that, but it was to save his own life. It was not to let the hatred take over him so that he would lose who he was. And if you look at that word, forgive, you give before, it's all positive about holding on to life and to love in the core being of our souls so that we are not overtaken by hatred. I've met a lot of victims' families along this road. One man described to me that it was like drinking po the hatred for the one who had killed his dad. It was like drinking poison in hopes that it kills the other one, but it was killing him. Bud Welch, whose story is in here, his daughter, Julie, was killed in the Oklahoma City bombing by Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols that set off the bomb. Julie had graduated from Marquette. She knew three languages. She was in the Murrah building that morning in Oklahoma City, had just gone over to translate from Spanish to English to some man 
who wanted to get her social security straight. And her, her co-worker said if she had waited five minutes and been over on our side of the building, but she had walked over just as the bomb went off. And Bud Welch talks about being in his Texaco station. Everybody heard the bomb. It was so huge. And then somebody said, Bud, Bud, it's the Murrah building. Isn't that where Julie works? And he's in his car rushing down there. And boy, and just seeing the, the shattered building, the glass is broken out of buildings all around. It reminded me of Hiroshima. When you go to the memorial, it has the time the bomb went off. They have that at Hiroshima. And then you walk there and you see 168 empty chair sculptures. Little chairs for the children, big chairs for the adults. Horrendous, horrendous crime. And he said, boy, I was waiting. And on the second day, a fireman carries out the body of our Julie. And boy, my journey began. He said, in the morning, when my feet would hit the floor, all I could think was, get McVeigh. And when they would arraign Timothy McVeigh and take him out of a police car, they had a lead vest on him to bring him in for the arraignment in the early part of the court thing. I'm glad they had that lead vest on him because I'd have been waiting for him and I gladly would have killed him, easily killed him. And then he said, I was angry all the time. I was drinking to get up in the morning. I'm drinking to go to sleep at night. I'm smoking five and a half packs of cigarettes. And about two months afterwards, he's in the car and Grace came to him through the knob of the car radio. And he goes to turn on that radio and he remembers being in the car with Julie. The radio was on, they were given the news. It was about another execution in Texas. And she had turned to him there in the car and said, Dad, that's about nothing but legalized vengeance. They kill, we kill them. I'm not for the death penalty, are you, Dad? And then it had been easy to tell her, no, I'm not. And what he, what he gets is that to honor Julie, truly honor her and who she was, that he could not ask for the death penalty because Julie herself, that he would dishonor her if he did that. And I've been with Bud on many occasions. We've spoken together. He telling his story. And his story is the last one in the Death of Innocence about that process. And then he brings it. The McVeighs, uh, the McVeighs lived in, in New York. And he knew the sister that worked, uh, who was the DRE in the parish. And he asked if she could arrange to have a meeting between him and Bill McVeigh, Tim's father. And you know, when we see these things in the news and all that, and well, yes, somebody has a father. Yes, somebody has a mother. Uh, and then and, and when you meet them, I mean, just real people, imagine the agony of Bill McVeigh. And so Bud arranges to go visit him at his house. And when he arrives at the front door, Timothy McVeigh's sister, who looks just like Timothy, met him at the front door. And before that visit was over, the two men were standing in the backyard in the Rose Garden. And Bud had his arms around Bill McVeigh. Both men are crying. And Bud is saying to him, I don't want to see your boy die. And of course, the father's going, how Timmy had slipped through the cracks, how there had been a divorce, how he had gone to Persian Gulf War I, came back totally screwed up, thinking he had a microchip in his body, hating the government, wanting to get revenge on the government for Waco and the killing of innocent kids and the firebombing in Waco. So he gets his revenge, as Bud Welch puts it. So Timothy McVeigh gets his revenge on the government for Waco, and now the government will kill Timothy McVeigh. And when will it stop? So he made it out. He made it out whole. And he gives a talk about Julie. He said, I can talk about Julie everywhere. Bill McVeigh doesn't even 
doesn't even dare to say his last name. And so we have these stories of human tragedy and suffering and loss far beyond my imagining, my reckoning, and I got plunged into all of them. And so when I came out of that execution chamber after Pat was executed, as I told you, and I just said, people are never going to get close to this. Actually, I'm writing a book now called River of Fire. It's the prequel to Dead Man Walking. It's the spiritual journey that led me in more depth to tell you the story of how I came to be in the killing chamber that night. And I have a prelude in that book as I'm writing it. And it goes like this, because it's called River of Fire. And it goes like this. They killed a man with fire one night. They strapped him in a wooden chair and pumped electricity through his body until he was dead. His killing was a legal act because he had killed. No religious leaders protested the killing that night. But I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. And what I saw set my soul on fire, a fire that burns in me still. And now here is an account of how I came to be in the killing chamber that night and of the spiritual currents that drew me there. In this book, no religious leaders protested the killing that night. It has been an ongoing dialogue with the American people especially and with my own church on the death penalty. In the beginning, 84, when Pat was executed, we began to work to educate the public to get out there, it was before a book, it was before a movie. I could never get Catholic leaders, bishops, to come to the press conference, to stand up publicly and go to the legislature. It's not where their interest was. It was because, and I, when I did have a chance to have a dialogue and to talk to Pope John Paul II, I said, this is an issue of the poor. And to the extent that we are concerned with poor and are with poor people, we're going to get it about the death penalty. And, and I asked him, can you please encourage the bishops to be on the side of the poor and in, invite people into deeper discourse as Catholics about the death penalty? And one of the things, because you know when you talk to a pope, it's no different from talking to you. It's not like you got special pope language and you use Pope words. It's just the same conversation, but I tell you the story here. It's in the second story of Joseph Odell, an innocent man in Virginia was about to be executed. Italy got involved. They sent over members of their parliament. I mean, Italy. I don't know if anybody in here is Italian, but you could be proud of your Italian heritage because these people care about human rights. They hear about Joseph Odell, this man of Virginia, who's just one more person to be executed. Virginia's a big killing state. Lo and behold, they start having a little stream of people come over. They got members of the Italian parliament come over. The mayor of Palermo comes, makes Joe Odell an honorary citizen of Palermo, and he says, and Joe, we will not let you be buried here on Virginia soil. We will bury you in a special grave at Palermo. Shows him a picture of his grave. <laughs> it's a very special cemetery, he says, only we're very important people. But he wanted to give him dignity. And lo and behold, that's the way it turned out. Virginia execute Joseph Adell. I get involved with the case. Go over to Italy to accompany his body to be buried in Palermo, and I got a chance to meet Pope John Paul. It was preceded by a letter. And I said to him, Your Holiness, does the Catholic Church only uphold the dignity of innocent life? And I get it. I'm a pro life Catholic, I'm for life across the board. But I said, When I'm walking with a man to execution, He's guilty of a terrible crime. I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay the horribleness of what he has done. But he's shackled. His legs are shackled. His hands are handcuffed to a belt around his waist. He's surrounded by six guards. And as we are walking, he says to me, Sister, please pray God holds up my legs. 
Do we as Catholics only uphold the dignity of the innocent life? What about the guilty? And, and I have it here in the book. You can look it up. But Pope John Paul, when he came to St. Louis in 1999, stood there and for the first time, we had our spiritual leader put the death penalty in with the other pro-life issues that Catholics are used to hearing. No to abortion, he said. No to euthanasia, he said. No to physician-assisted suicide, he said. And no to the death penalty. It's cruel and it's unnecessary. And he had said earlier in his encyclical, The Gospel of Life, that we have a way to protect life in prisons. We don't have to imitate the violence and, and kill the people who kill others. And then he said, even those among us who have done a terrible crime have a dignity that must not be taken from them. And that dignity he's referring to is a common ground we can all stand in in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 3, everyone has a right to life. Article 5, no one shall be subjected to cruel and degrading punishment or torture. So whether or not a person ever steps in church or whatever faith persuasion or not that they have, we can all stand in human rights. I love in your national anthem, we stand on guard for thee, and you as Canadians need to stand on guard. You begin, you having over the last 10 years or so, maybe a little longer, some kind of harsh measures toward sending people to prison and for longer sen sen sentences in the imitating your sister below you in the United States. We are finally coming to that we have massively warehoused people in prison and we're just beginning to turn to the life road and away from the massive incarceration of 2.3 million people, more than any country in the world, beginning to set our face on restorative justice and on life and not on death and not on pain and punishment, but to restore human beings, rehabilitative justice. That's the road that we all need to go on, and I'll leave that with you. Very much.